Well, thank you very much. I would really like to start thanking GAA for inviting me here and to give me the opportunity to present some of my ideas. I would like to thank the beautiful Guangzhou city for its hospitality. And as Steve said before, uh, in the day zero we had a session about fish meat and fish oil and the focus was very much also on how we can source fish meat and fish oil from responsible or sustainable origin. <clears throat> and now I will go ahead with a little bit of a presentation and we start with this graph. This graph is a beauty. We have seen that many, many times. It is the fishery production and the aquaculture production. It is a beauty, but it is also extremely dangerous because it is possibly misleading and actually this trigger a lot of concern. Similar to what we've seen before, the public responds in a different way and they always look for negative information. And in fact, the story starts here. And the big question here that is that we actually catch a fish from the wild, converting it into pellet, and then use these to farm fish. And according, there's a lot of uh, stakeholders also that actually point the finger at aquaculture because of this. And <clears throat> this finger pointing at aquaculture is fundamentally based on the assumption that the rapid growth of aquaculture and the requirement for fish meal and fish oil for aqua feed is actually contributing to the possible decline of the global fish stock. So this is what we are looking at. But the reality is a little bit different. And I think we need to look a little bit more into the detail of that graph to understand what we are talking about. So this is the global fishery production in the last 40 years. In reality, and, and the critic is, yes, we expanded, we reached the maximum level, and now we are at plateau, and possibly we can even have a decline. But if we look at the composition of this graph, you will see that we have seaweed, freshwater, crustacean and mollusk, and marine king fish for edible purposes. They are all growing at different levels. And only 30% is actually the total catch is the marine fish used for fish meal and fish oil. So in reality, we should not really look at all the others because that's not what we are talking about. We are simply talking about those fish which are catch in the wild and then converted into fish meal and fish oil. And their production has been very much constant. And after rendering to the reduction process, we are basically producing a constant amount of about 5 million tons of fish meat and 1 million tons of fish oil every year. And this has been constant, so it is already quite different from the initial graph I presented. So if we put together now the massive growth of aquaculture, which expanded from 5 million tons in 76 up to 100 million tons in 2013, the situation is different. And again, when people start pointing a finger at aquaculture, say, you are destroying the world, because you are catching all the fish, you need to look at this graph. And if you look at this graph, you can say, no, we are not. We are not destroying the fish, the, the world, because the amount of fish meal and fish oil that was produced even before, let's say, aquaculture was born, was exactly the same as it is today. So, <clears throat> what is the situation? What is the real impact of this situation is very much an economic issue. It is the demand and supply law. What's happening is that we have a rapidly growing agriculture sector that will require fish meal and fish oil, and the supply is constant and is limited, and is illogical to think we can produce more. So the result is very much a constant increase in price of those raw materials. So the, from an aquaculture point of view, the issue is an economic sustainability issue, it's not an environmental sustainability issue. So if we want to still using this graph and think about what can happen in the future, I really like to actually look at what happened in the past, because if we understand the past, we might be able to predict the future. So I've done a little history of uh, fish meat uses. So after the Second World War, we start producing about 5 million tons of fish meat. And this was initially used for relatively cheap application like fertilizer or even for the uh, polygastric uh, cattle and beef, and a little bit for chicken and pork. With the expansion of the monogastric production, chicken and pork, they were fundamentally purchasing the vast majority of these 5 million tons 
of fish meal in the, in the 70s. In the 90s, then we had the growth of aquaculture. And for aquaculture, fish meal is a more important protein source compared to the monogastric. So aquaculture was ready to pay more and acquiring more of these valuable uh, resources. It doesn't entail the vast majority of the production is actually used by aquaculture. So nowadays, still a little bit, and I thank Neil for uh, educating me on this on the first day. There's always something good to learn when you go to this kind of session in day zero. Still, a, a small amount is used by the pig and the poultry section, uh, the industry. And specifically, what's happened there was that they couldn't use any more fish meal as a protein source. And what they start using it is a specialty ingredient to, uh, to be used in a specific stage of the production cycle. At the very low inclusion level, when it, the animal is very susceptible and growing fast like during the winning process. So it is converted from being a main protein source to a specialty ingredient. So if we want to look at the future for aquaculture, and if we imagine, for example, we're going to double again the production of aquaculture in the next 10 years, it means we need to half the amount of fish meal we use per unit of production. So aquaculture, as suggested by Ron Hardy before, it will no longer be a primary protein source for aquafits, but it will be used as a specialty ingredient, added to enhance palatability, for example, to balance dietary amino acids, to supply other essential nutrients, for example, uh, <coughs> taurine, and biological active compounds, and enhance product quality. I think this is the future of fish meal to be used in aquaculture. Fish oil is a little bit different. So in the 1950s, <coughs> fish oil was again produced about the same level as today, about one million tons, and it was used fundamentally for industrial purposes. It was used for lubricant and for paint, and a little bit was actually saturated and then used in the baking industry. In the 1970s, again, the pork and poultry sector start using fish oil because it's a fantastic edible oil with very good nutritional quality. But in the 1990s, aquaculture was expanding and started buying more and more. And again, for aquaculture, fish oil was more important than for the poultry and, uh, and pig industry. So the aquaculture is ready to pay an extra, ex to pay more to, to buy this uh, precious oil. In 2010, or let's say nowadays, the vast majority of the global fish oil production is used by aquaculture. But differently from fish meal, we now have another player coming in this context, which is the nutraceutical. So the fish oil tablets or whatever, or fortified food, nutraceutical. These guys are ready to pay an extra premium compared to aquaculture. They can afford it. And therefore, if we want to predict which market will use fish oil in the future, Again, I will use the words of another expert, and this is Anthony Bingo, so and I predicted that that market would be the nutraceutical market, not aquaculture. The production cannot expand, and someone stronger than aquaculture is coming and buying. So what can happen in the future? And again, we need to go back to the initial graph, the rapid growth of aquaculture. Again, beautiful graph, but partially misleading, because the story is quite different. If we look at the composition of this growth, we have a lot of different components. And let's start, for example, with about 30% is seaweed and 15% is filtering feeding mollusks. These are not fed. We don't use any feed for them. So we really don't need to talk about them and we need to exclude them. We left over with about 54 million tons. And in this case, we have 30% of carbs, tilapia 5, milkfish 1, catfish 4, Freshwater crustacean 2 and freshwater thin fish 1.5%. Fish meal and fish oil are currently used in the aqua feed at relatively small inclusion rate. They are progressively less included, and the important fact they are not really needed for this species. So, production is possible without fish meal and fish oil. And in the future, there won't be any problem in continuing production and expansion of this sector, even without fish meal and fish oil, or with reduced amount of fish meal and fish oil. If we remove them, we end up with basically three sectors. Marine fin fish, 2.4%, salmonids, 3.2%, and marine shrimps, 5 or 7%. In total, about 11 million tons of production. Again, for this species, fish meal and fish oil are currently used in their aquafeed. The content is mid to variable, 
and again is progressively less. And even for these species, fish meal and fish oil, they are not needed from a nutrition point of view, and production is actually possible without fish meal and fish oil. So when I say this, typically this is the expression of people in my audience. What the hell are you saying? <clears throat> This is what I'm saying. I'm saying that no fish and no shrimp actually needs any fish meal. What they need are essential amino acids and the correct protein to energy ratio. And fish meal, by chance, is just an excellent source of highly digestible, highly palatable dietary protein with an excellent amino acid composition of the essential amino acid and also the non-essential amino acids. And also it has basically no anti-nutritional factor. So it is very much gold for a fish nutritionist but it's not essential. Fish meal can be replaced. We can do it. I've done many times. The only problem is that right now, if we want to replace fish meal, it will cost us much more than actually using fish meal. So we need to actually support R&D to reduce actually the cost of fish meal replacement strategies. And when it comes to fish oil, again, no fish, no shrimp needs any fish oil. What they need is a highly digestible energy source, essential fatty acids, and in particular, the long chain omega-3 fatty acid, and shrimp, so they also need phospholipids and cholesterol. And if we look outside the fish oil, so what all the other oil available, we have plenty of alternative oils, which actually provide a lot of highly digestible energy, phospholipids and cholesterol. But here we have a bottleneck. The bottleneck is omega-3, and in particular, long chain omega-3 fatty acid, EPA and DHA. These are currently present only by fish oil fundamentally. So if we look at the requirement of fish of these important fatty acids, there are three different levels we need to consider. If we just want to satisfy the minimum requirement of the animal, these are very little. Very small amount of EPA and DHA is needed to satisfy the physiological requirement of farm fish, and we have no problem. If we want to actually satisfy the requirement for maximal growth and health of the stock, then we need to include a little bit more, and we might start having some problems from some sectors in, in particular. But the big issue is when we want to satisfy the nutritional quality expectation more than requirement of consumer. So if we want to provide enough EPA and DHA in the fish, so that, that the final product will contain enough EPA and DHA to make consumer happy. This is a big problem. This is actually impacting the sector and is shaping the sector. So, this is what's happening. Fish meal and fish oil inclusion in aquafeed is currently constantly and rapidly declining. Less fish meal, less fish oil is going in, and more agricultural land based products and byproducts going in. On the day zero, I received many questions. Many people ask me, why comp aquafeed companies do so? Well, I try to come up with two answers. <clears throat> First part of the answer is because of consumer perception of sustainability and impact of aquaculture. This is affecting the retailer's perception of consumer expectations. And this is actually impacting the farmer's perception of retailer's expectations. And you end up with farmers actually asking the feed meal company to make feed with low fish meal and fish oil. And if you have a customer asking you to reduce fish meal and fish oil, and you can, you try to do so. Plus, additionally, it is a very good marketing tool for feed company. They can go around the world and say, oh, we can make feed with very little fish meal and fish oil. But then there is another reason which is possibly even more important. The first aspect is based on dollar. So we have an increasing price of fish meal and fish oil. This is seen as basically reducing the margin for the feed company. But not just the constant price, it's also the volatility. You never know what's happening. You can buy fish meal and fish oil one day, and maybe you can't after two weeks. And this is affecting the industry. And very, the, the, the last point, which is something maybe not very, uh, people outside the sector are aware of, is actually the uncertainty availability in terms of quantity and even more so quality of fish meal and fish oil. This is one of the biggest problems for the feed industry. Because if you make a formulation today with that specific batch of fish meal, it could not work in two weeks' time because the next batch of fish meal is completely different. It could be much better, and you can use less, or it could be much worse, and you need to use much more. And you need to readjust the formulation of the feed. And adjusting the formulation of the feed, it is technologically extremely challenging. Extruding an aquafit pellet, it is a science, but it's very much an art form. It is difficult. This is a problem. So give an aquafit company something of a lower quality, but of a constant supply 
then they will be they will more likely prefer that compared to something of a higher quality of an uncertain supply. So replacing fish meal in terms of quality, I'm a little bit long here, yeah, I will speed up. There's no effect on final product quality. The possible effect are on fish performance and fish health, and I would refer to that as a quantitative issue. When it comes to fish oil, the diff is completely different. When we replace fish oil, the major effects are on the final product quality. So the final fatty acid composition is affected. So it is a qualitative issue. And here I present some data that I, uh, I really thank Matthew Sprague from Sterling University to give me this fantastic data. You can see the evolution of fatty acid composition of Scottish farm Atlantic salmon from 2016 to 2015. You can see in blue EPA and DHA, which are the long chain omega-3 coming from uh, fish oil going down. And then the three fatty acids, 18.3, 18.2, and 18.1, which are typical of canola, rapeseed. And this is a clear result of the increasing amount of canola oil going into the feed, resulting in a modification of the fillet. And then again, you have the media and the social blogger criticizing aquaculture and say, aquaculture uh, product now has very little omega-3. That's what I did. I went to the market a few years ago to answer this question, and I done an analysis. In blue, you can see farm fish. Sorry, in blue is wild fish. In red, farm fish. This is what bloggers use to point the finger in aquaculture, and also a lot of claimed nutritional experts. These data represent the percentage EPA and DHA on total fatty acid. But I'm sure that we don't eat much percentage. What we normally eat is milligram, correct? So if we change the unit and we report the graph as milligram of fatty acid per 100 gram of edible portion, you will see the farm fish is actually the best source of long chain omega-3. And this is simply because it is fatter. Farm fish contain more fat and therefore it is more tasty and also it contain more long chain omega-3, even if in percentage is lower. Again, you can see this is the same graph seen from Matthew Sprague from Sterling, the total amount of declining EPA and DHA, in this case reported as milligram per 100 gram. We were about 3 gram per 100 gram in 2006, and we are about 1.5 gram in 2014. And sample from other parts of the world, Norway and Tasmania, very much similar. So to put this in the context, I just put here, uh, there's a lot of different re the, uh, recommended daily intake for omega-3, but the most commonly accepted is about 500 milligrams per day for a healthy adult. So in 2006, one portion of 100 grams of salmon was enough to satisfy our requirement for six days, in 2015 for two, three days. This is what's happening. We can't do much about that. The good news is that we simply need to eat more farm fish. So the future. <clears throat> fish meal, almost all global production will be available for aquafit. No longer a protein source, but a specialty ingredient. There will be less fish meal un used per unit of feed, but much better used. Fish oil, I think small or nil uh, fraction of the global production will actually be available for aquafit, but there will be possible alternative source of long chain needed, uh, available. And these are very much the case of non-edible or source which are of low ed edible qualities. For example, we need to look much more in fish and byproduct soil. This is growing, we need to grow it more. Genetically modified crop is coming, and uh, the first indication suggests the consumer are not really happy to consume directly genetically modified oil containing EPA and DHA, but they will be quite okay if this is used in aquafit. And single cell uh, or algae oils. And the, the good news here is that eventually the biodiesel hype is going over, so actually all those guys invested a lot in single cell and algae oil now, they need to find a new market, and aquafit could be a new market for them. And last, from an industry, I think what we really need to do, and this could be a good starting point, the platform, we need really to identify the minimal level of omega-3 acceptable in the final product, which will clearly be species-specific and likely relative to RDI or marketing objective. Once we know, we decide that that specific species must not go below that specific level, then the industry can definitely find solution to deliver. So thank you very much for your attention.